hi everyone. Uh, this is our last art lecture for the year, the crazy year of 2020, 2019-2020. And I just want to thank everyone that has supported us through the transition to remote teaching um, and the art lecture. So the people at Electronic Media and Julie Ron, who helps with some of the um, contact with the speakers, the artists, and the scholars that come to us. Um, today we have Dr. Kenton Ramsey as our um, lecturer, and I'm going to hand it over to a student that's coming out of the capstone in literary arts and humanities, um, Eden Staplefoot, to give the introduction. So thank you, Eden. Thank you. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Kenton Ramsey. Ken Ramsey is an assistant professor of African American literature and digital humanities at the University of Texas at Arlington. He is a graduate of Morehouse College as well as the University of Kansas, where he received his PhD in English. He is the author of the Geographies of African American Short Fiction, 1925 through 2018, forthcoming with the University of Mississippi Press. At the University of Texas at Arlington, Dr. Ramsey teaches The Life and Times of S. Carter also known as the Jay-Z class. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of attending his workshop for the Advanced Writing Capstone, where he discussed Jay-Z's work in connection to signifying and other forms of storytelling in a digital age. The Jay-Z class intersects digital humanities and African-American literature and argues for ways humanities majors and literary arts majors in particular can produce powerful arguments through data and outside of traditional written forms. Dr. Ramsey's class places a rapper in a broad African-American literary continuum of autobiographical and semi-autobiographical works, including Ralph mm -hmm. Ellison, Frederick Douglass, as well as their respective sampling of texts from figures like Booker T. Washington. And the class students create, a, create de data sets on Jay-Z in order to produce thematic data visualizations, liter literary timelines, and a list of key terms that demonstrate the literary merit of rap music and its close ties to the larger field of African American literature. Among Dr. Ramsey's numerous achievements are his work as coordinator of the Project Digital Initiative on the History of Black Writing. In this position, Dr. Ramsey funded, founded the African American literary blog and oversaw digital projects using text mining and topic modeling tools to explore a robust collection of over 1,500 black novels. Dr. Ramsey's expertise in the area of text mining and data visualization allowed him to co-direct Shishat, a Howard University Digital Humanities Initiative funded by a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. Dr. Ramsey's blogs can be found at culturalfront.org and at the African American Literary Stud Studies Lab, co-founded with his brother, Dr. Howard Ramsey at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Dr. Ramsey was also part of the Smart Revolution, a metadata collection project with African American and American anthologies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ramsey to our Evergreen community. Thanks so much, Eden, for that introduction. Uh, literally, I, I, I can't say thanks enough. I really enjoyed our conversations yesterday. I also wanna say thank you all so much for being here with me today and talking about what I love to talk about, nerd topics, literature, hip hop, data, all of that. I really do appreciate it. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with uh, the class yesterday, the, uh, the class team taught by Dr. Kalk and Dr. Kostanis, and I really, really enjoyed the interaction. Um, in the age of COVID, it's so interesting how much I have really missed that teacher component interacting with the students, wrestling with ideas. So I am very grateful and fortunate that I could still participate in this series. And more so, again, just thank you so much for, you know, inviting me. I really do appreciate it. Yesterday, uh, it was very interesting for me because we were putting Jay-Z in conversation with Bach Team, particularly, you know, the di dialogic imagination. Particularly, we were focusing on the essay novel, epic and novel. And, you know, in this essay, Bach Team is really arguing that the novel is this great form, even though at the time when he was giving his lecture, you know, he saw it as like a very, you know, immature form, but still a great form with a lot of promise. And I think one of the things that is so interesting to me, he had three basic characteristics that fundamentally distinguished the novel in principle from other genres. 
Number one, he said it's stylistic three-dimensionality, which is linked with multi-language consciousness realized in the novel. Two, he said the radical change in its effect and the temporal coordinates of the literary image and imagination. And third, he said the new zone opened by the novel for structuring literary images, namely the zone of maximal contact with the present and contemporary reality. Bakhtin was referencing the novel, but I really do think what he says applies so much to rap music. So what I'm trying to do, you all, I'm, again, so happy that you all have joined me, but this is kind of uh, somewhat of a different type of lecture, but I'm also looking at the positive side because I get to share a little bit of digital media with you all in this conversation. Today, we're going to have a virtual listening session as I talk through some of my favorite songs with Jay's about Jay-Z. Um, with that being said, I want to start with a video just to give us all an idea to ground us with who better else than Jay-Z to speak. So one moment. Poets out of the black arts movement in the 60s, the, that, this is where the rap comes from. Rap comes from, we are the old men of the rap age. When we started bringing the music and the poetry and stuff together, it was considered, wow, we said, we want poetry that you can take out of these classrooms, that you can read in bars and taverns, that you can read in playgrounds, you can read on the street. So we did in the 60s. That's what I used to tell my students. You think your stuff is good? See those guys digging a hole in the street there? When they get a, a minute off to eat a sandwich, go read them a poem. If you don't get hit in the head, if you don't get hit in the head, you've got a future. This book that rap is a it's poetry and it is, it isn't just, you know, it's thought provoking and there's thought behind it. And there's great writing in rap as well. You know, you never hear rappers being compared for like the greatest rap writers of all time. You know, you hear Bob Dylan, it was so is Biggie Smalls, like in, in the Hitchcock way, you know, some of the things that Biggie wrote. Rakim, I mean, listen to some of the things he wrote. I mean, if you take those lyrics and you pull them away from the music and you put them up on the wall somewhere and someone had to look at them, they would say, well, this is genius. This is genius work. So I want people to take that away. I want people to also take away the quick judgments. Listen to the song, listen to his intent. Try to figure out why a song like Big Pimpin' can exist. The same way you try to figure out a song like Meet the Parents exists. I mean, it's clearly obvious that this has different meaning, but this on the surface is just fun and party music, but there's reasons behind that as well. So I, I really wanted to lay this out in a clear, concise way that people could look at it and say, okay, and if there's thought and there's intelligence and there's reason and logic behind it, then maybe you have to deal with everything like that. So you all, I really like starting there, especially in my talk with Jay-Z, actually with his words. Troubled circumstances in his youth, an occupant of environment shaped by persistent and structural anti-Black racism, a memoir on his experiences. Those characteristics describe Frederick Douglass, Richard Wright, Malcolm X, and others. They also describe the life and times of Sean Carter, best known as Jay-Z. So, for the literary enthusiasts who might be joining us virtually this afternoon, I'm not here to convince you that Jay-Z is a literary figure. When people ask me, is Jay-Z a poet or a writer, I oftentimes respond, well, who's poet and who's poetry? Now, for the rap fans that might be also tuning in, I'm not here to make the case or debate why I think Jay-Z is one of the best rappers of all time. Beyond rap, Jay-Z is one of the most successful entertainers who is second only to the Beatles for the most number one records in history. Today, I want to explain why Jay-Z is an ideal figure to use when organizing data about the history and interconnectedness of Black art. In this interactive listening session, I'll be sharing excerpts from my digital book, The Jay-Z Mixtape, published by the Publishing Without Walls Digital Humanities Initiative. This publication is the first to be released through this publishing initiative sponsored by the Mellon, uh, Andrew Mellon Foundation. Embedded within this digital publication are interactive charts that offer new considerations of Jay-Z's overall musical legacy. Over the last decade, scholars have conceived of the digital man humanities as a way of extending the toolkits of traditional scholarship to explore issues related to linguistic, thematic, and geographic features of literary art. 
Building on earlier generations of computational approaches to humanities research, I've used Jay-Z as a model to structure different types of data and to create an extensive data set that reveals the interconnectivity of his music. Some wonder why, since I'm a literature professor, why not focus on more traditional literary artists like Zora Neale Hurston, Richard Wright, Toni Morrison, Edward P. Jones, and others? Well, copyright laws and access to digitized sources are a big hurdle to overcome when trying to conduct digital analysis on traditional literary texts. In terms of hip hop, though, there is a large online community of people using technology to compile and organize rap lyrics in far more advanced ways than in African American literature and American literature. As Eden mentioned, at the University of Texas at Arlington, I teach a course that places Jay Z within a literary continuum of autobiographical and semi-autobiographical text by writers such as Douglas, Frederick Douglass, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, and even Barack Obama. My Jay-Z course prompts students to expand their definitions of lyrics and literature. In addition, this course also gives students the, the chance to work and structure various types of data to create different visualizations and graphs. One of the most crucial imperatives among scholars of African-American literature over the last 20 to 30 years has involved showing the relationship between Black writers and Black writers. That is, scholars have sought to highlight the ways that Black writers signify on or allude to the works of other Black writers. That practice is known in some areas as intertextuality. And really, it's that spirit of interconnectivity that has guided my research and writing on Jay-Z. So. Right now, what we're about to do, you all, I want us to really focus on reading the lyrics and understanding the type of songs that Jay-Z is trying to communicate and why they can exist. I am a literature professor, after all, so I am going to advocate for a close read. I'm about to start this digital listening session with a song called December 4th. Um, December 4th is from Jay-Z's 2003 album, The Blackout. This is one of my favorite songs to introduce people when discussing Jay-Z because it's essentially a lyrical autobiography. Jay-Z narrates, narrates his life in three movements. First, his birth and childhood. Next, his coming of age and selling drugs. And finally, his decision to choose rap over a life of crime. Jay-Z's mother, Gloria Carter, chimes in on the choruses and she narrates his moments in his life, offering insightful commentary about his development. He closes December 4th rapping. If you can't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. Maybe you'll love me when I fade to black. For me, that fade to black line is so crucial connecting Jay-Z to a tradition of African-American narrative, I mean, of narratives about black men. Oftentimes when a black man becomes enlightened, he is no longer able to exist in society. For instance, in James Weldon Johnson's autobiography, The Next Color Man, he decides to pass for white once he realizes his skin will impede upon his ability to leave, live freely. Also, think of Bigger Thomas and Richard Wright's native son. Once he realizes he is the victim of institutional racism, he is executed for his crimes against society. Also, one of my favorite novels, and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, once the unnamed protagonist understands the extents of racism, he goes underground vowing to return only when he's come up with a suitable solution and plan for liberation. So with that being said, I kind of look at Jay-Z as a continuation of those narratives. Right now, what we're gonna start doing is I'm gonna share the screen and actually share the lyrics from Rap Genius so you all can read along as we're actually listening to the song.
my mama with cash my sh- The little brothers ring fingers get cut up All right, everyone. So again, that was December 4th. Again, Jay-Z's birthday, December 4th. A lot of times I use this song as a gateway to even think about slave narratives, for instance. Think about in Frederick Douglass's narrative. Typically, he has someone validating his experiences that are written right before his actual narrative. This is something kind of confirming that this story was indeed written by a formerly enslaved person. I think his mother kind of acts as the same way within that. So I think it's cool in terms of talking about the actual structures of autobiographies using Jay-Z. Now, again, I talked to you all about the Jay-Z mixtape, and I'm going to start sharing a first interactive visualization that shows his top producers. And I want to use this to talk about the next song, which is American Dreaming from Jay-Z's album, The American Gangster. Um, The reason why I think this song that I want to share it is because he collaborated with music mogul and producer Sean Puff Daddy Combs. Rarely had Jay-Z and Puff Daddy collaborated over the span of their careers, but in 2007, Diddy proved to be a vital asset in the production of Jay-Z's American Gangster album. This is how the story goes. In mid-October 2007, Jay-Z was invited to a pre-screening of the movie American Gangster starring Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe. The viewing of the film inspired Jay-Z so much that he produced a full-length album. The viewing of the film, I'm sorry, he wanted to make an album that narrated life from the perspective of Denzel Washington's character, Frank Lucas. Only problem is, the movie was scheduled to come out in three weeks. So, a few nights after seeing the film, Diddy invited Jay-Z to his studio. At the time, Diddy did not know that Jay-Z had been considering recording an album. When Jay-Z arrived, he heard all of these lush samples and all the 70s soul music, which relates straight to the movie he had just seen. That night, Jay-Z ended up going home with 30 of the sampled tracks and began crafting the album American Gangster. After he recorded his vocals, he sent some songs back to Diddy. Then Diddy and his production team enhanced the songs using live horns and strings, as well as drums and street percussionists to add depth to the songs. Jay-Z said, The thing that I realized about Puff is that he's not a good producer. He's a great producer. Puff Daddy produced six tracks and arguably the most important songs on the album. During his VH1 Storyteller sessions, Jay-Z explained the album is a journey. It starts with a song called Pray and ends with a song called Fallen. American Dreaming is him and his homeboy dreaming about having the finer things in life. Dreaming about getting their mother a home. And you know all the dreams as... Uh, young and black and white and Latino people. I'm especially fond of the third verse of this song. Jay-Z has grown up in three verses. We've been with him during his uncertain times, and now he is a drug kingpin. Midway through the verse, Jay-Z has to pause for a second. He's caught up in talking about business so much that he has to pause to think about life. The biggest question for me is why is Jay advising anyone to follow in his footsteps? And he seems to question this too. 
I really love this title, American Dreaming, too, because it reminds me of an essay by Ralph Ellison that I incorporate when teaching this song, Change the Joke and Slip the Yoke. In this, and I'm paraphrasing, he basically makes the argument that African Americans believe in the American dream more than ca our Caucasian counterpoints. Uh, counterparts, pardon me. Despite the odds and all of the factual evidence, many Black people believe in individual abilities and tend to down play the role of institutional racism and discrimination. Now, that's a whole lot to talk about, but I love wrestling with these ideas with my students. I'm about to share a screen again and show you all the Jay-Z mixtape. This is the screen of it. And this is the top producers. As we can see here, you can click on, pardon me, let me refresh. You can click on this actual interactive visualization to learn more. I'm gonna click on Diddy. These are all of Jay-Z's albums and songs. As we can see, J P. Diddy does not necessarily contribute to that many songs, but these six songs are crucial. It's producer Timbaland has produced, I mean, contributed this much to Jay-Z. Even Kanye West has contributed this much. Now I want us to really pay attention to American Dreaming and think about how Jay-Z remixes this. thing I want to really emphasize about this song, you all, is that um, 
in Zoom to show Zoom windows when sharing. We are seeing Zoom sharing control superimposed over your video. Okay, sorry. Thank you for that, actually. A role. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize about this song is that Jay Z created an entire album within three weeks. And I really think that speaks to kind of what we're doing with this entire lecture series, which we're talking about the creativity aspect of this. So, with that being said, um, I really want us to think about what does it take to produce an entire rap album in three weeks? And exactly where do you have to be in your career to even pull on major super producers like P. Diddy? I think it shows that something about art is not just um, can we create beautiful art, it also says how do we have access to, you know, resources to actually do that as well. So that's something I want us to keep in mind. As you notice, probably during that song, Jay-Z sampled Marvin Gaye, and I think that's so interesting. And on the subject of sampling, this is so important because I'm always reminded about how Jay-Z is a master sampler. Um, this next visualization that I'll share to you before listening to the song, it sh visualizes over 600 samples that Jay-Z draws on across 12 of his 13 solo albums. And the reason why I think this is so important is because Invisible Man, again, I'm going back to that book because I think that book has made a profound impact on me. I think when the unnamed protagonist is invited to a battle royale at the beginning of the story, he thinks he's supposed to give this in graduation speech, but he's really, again, he's supposed to box. I think one part that is so cool is because when he, they finally let him give his speech, you know, he says, cast your buckets down where you are, blah, 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 blah. He is sampling Booker T. Washington's Atlanta exposition speech. And I think that is so cool to me because we see how, again, this idea of art is ever living, ever changing. And it also speaks to Bakhtin's point about how do we really, how does the novel help us to include so many types of contemporary realities? The next song that I want to listen to is off of Jay-Z's Blueprint album. It's called Never Changed and it's produced by Kanye West. Kanye has been very instrumental in helping Jay-Z to craft a unique sound. As a rapper and a producer, Kanye's work can be described as repurposing an existing song with contemporary hip-hop vibe. He's known for picking out an obscure phrase or taking the most popular melody from a song and building an entirely new and electrifying track. The song samples David Ruffin's Coming Man. That is heard repeating never change in the background. Jay-Z reassures listeners that he hasn't changed since coming into the rap game and is still Sean Carter. The notion of keeping it real is even found in Shakespeare's To Thine Own Self Be True and even further back in Greek plays. So I think that's important to pay attention to. I want to also read an excerpt from the 25th anniversary of Signifying Monkey by Henry Louis Gates. In this 25th anniversary edition, Gates writes a new introduction. And this part is so cool to me. He says, and I quote, as you can see, Hip hop sampling has less to do with signifying upon chart toppers than recovering signal formal elements in both well-known canonical R&B and soul songs and in forgotten singles, often, but not always, the songs that, quite, that nobody quite remembers or even heard the first time around. Ninth Wonder, a producer who has worked with Jay-Z, is also um, a professor at Harvard now, explained at his Hutchinson Center lecture that hip hop sampling is all about, and I quote, taking something that may be scraps and turning them into jewels. It requires a team of, of obsessed researchers and an immense amount of patience and concentration to sift through thousands of old vinyl records and perhaps most importantly, an incredible knowledge of African-American music history and a keenly sensitive ear for what can revive and redefine both the tradition and compositions being constructed. During the second verse, one of my favorite line, similes by Jay-Z is when he says, plead the fifth when it comes to the fam. I'm like a dog. I never speak, but I understand. In this line, he uses the Constitution to support a street concept of no snitching. It reminds me of just how penetrating American ideology is. I mean, it has every bearing, even on street culture. So... I want to share a video. I want to share again my screen to show you another sample from the Jay-Z mixtape. And again, I'm sorry, the Jay-Z mixtape. And this is the musical samples. This song comes from the blueprint. So I'm going to click on this right here. I'm going to click on it right here. With this being said, we can see how the samples are actually used within his song. And we can see the people that he actually samples throughout the album. He samples the movie Scarface. He samples a song by Eddie Murphy. He samples Dougie Fresh. So again, we kind of really get to look at 
the actual sampling and see how uh, important it is to Jay-Z's overall music. Now, again, that song is... Again, it was a song called Never Change. And I'm really trying to show these songs and share these songs to illustrate how prevalent samples are. Even though these songs were, even though these albums by Jay-Z came out in the late 90s and early 2000s, I think it's so important to think about how he's remixing and incorporating his childhood into his music. For instance, he was born on the day that Fred Hampton died on De in December 1969. As a result of that, we really see that Jay-Z was impacted by music throughout his childhood because we keep hearing this soulfulness within his music. And I think that's one big thing that I want to talk about. Now, the last thing that I want to kind of touch on about Jay-Z before opening things up for questions is thinking about what happens to rap at 50. Well, it might be debatable to say that rap is 50 years old. Some people might say it's older than that. Some people might say it's probably not as old as that. But my point is Jay-Z turned 50 this past December. And I wanna make the argument that he is still relevant as a rapper. Um, I said this yesterday to the class, I am a huge Law & Order SVU fan. And I think it's so important to note that Ice-T started off as a rapper, but he is now more uh, credible as an actor. Same with Will Smith, right? Same with Will Smith. He started off as the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air with Jazzy Jeff, but now he's known more as a rapper. We could say the same thing about LL Cool J, now who's also starring on crime shows. Um, Jay-Z, however, is still relevant as a rapper. 
So once you reach 50 in the rap game, what do you do? What is the new blueprint, so to speak? And I think Jay-Z has been innovating that model. Over the last few years, Jay-Z has used his voice to intensify the conversations about the criminal justice reform system by serving as an executive producer of films that reveal how people of color are over policed arrested, and accused of crimes at higher rates than others. In 2016, he narrated The War on Drugs is an Epic Fail, a video op-ed published by the New York Times that highlighted how years of racially biased police policies have contributed to the disproportionate number of Black people in prison for simple drug charges. On June 16th, 2017, Jay-Z published an article for Time magazine describing the injustices of the bail bond industry. He writes, when Black and brown people are over and arrested and accused of crimes at higher rates than others, and then forced to pay for their freedom because before they even see a trial, big bail companies prosper. In March 2017, Jay-Z co-produced the Khalif Browder story on Netflix, a six-part documentary about a, black, a young Black man from the Bronx who spent three years in prison, two of those in solitary confinement, without even being convicted of a crime. Another time, Jay-Z served as an ex executive producer of the series Rest in Power, the Trayvon Martin story, which premiered on July 30th, 2018. Jay-Z has also now has also worked on a documentary focusing on the Philadelphia rapper Meek Mill's 10-year battle with the Philadelphia judicial system and the disproportional incarceration rates of other people of color in Philly. In November 2018, he wrote an article for the New York Times pointing out that rapper Meek Mill and countless other people of color have been victims of unreasonable and prejudiced probation guidelines. He writes that probation is a trap and we must fight for Meek and everyone else unjustly sent to prison. Upon his release, Jay-Z began to uh, mentor Meek Mill and revealed that he paid a substantial part of his legal fees. Other rappers have also come forward and confirmed that Jay-Z is indeed his brother's keeper. Lil Wayne noted that Jay-Z helped him when he was really, really, really down. Lil Wayne explained how Jay-Z helped him pay off substantial tax debt, noting that the Brooklyn-born rapper is a real friend. Also, just recently, and I'm blanking right now just on the name um, of the rapper who was supposed to be deported back to Europe, and Jay-Z and his legal team inter intervened and really helped him from being deported. When all is said and done, what will make Jay-Z the GOAT, or greatest of all time, will be more than just his music. His persistence to confront the new Jim Crow head-on demonstrates a commitment to freedom and justice to so many civil rights advocates, who, to so, like, just like so many advocates who have come before him. Now, I want to end with showing his War on Crime is an Epic Fail, the op-ed that he uh, published in the New York Times as a video. One of the reasons that I really want to share this is because I think it's absolutely timely right now to talk about uh, the, the, the different types of challenges that we face right now, particularly in our communities. Um, George Floyd was a terrible and unfortunate incident that was caught on camera, but I really think, like Jay-Z, I use him to talk about not only literature, but other cultural issues. So in the Q&A period, in the Q&A session after we watch this video, I really want you all to think about not only as Jay-Z as a rapper, think about him as a lyricist, someone who is deeply entrenched with liter the literary form using employing similes and sampling and signifying. In addition to that, I want us to think about Jay-Z as charting new territory for rappers to think about how do you mature. So again, I'm about to share this, one moment please, the war on drugs is an epic fail. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. 
in the 1990s, incarceration rates in the U.S. blew up. Today, we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough-on-crime laws, and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. Even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana, they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared this so-called war in 1971. Forty-five years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. So again, the last thing that I want to leave you all with is when students sign up for my class on Jay-Z, um, they oftentimes think that, oh, all we're going to do is sit around and listen to rap music. This is so cool. I kind of fool them in some types of ways. Not only are we talking about the importance of data analytic methods and how to apply those to actually analyzing Jay-Z's music and producing interactive visualizations, I also think about Jay-Z as a gateway figure a gateway figure to numerous topics, a numerous other figures as well. I talked to you about pairing Jay-Z's uh, albums and songs with works by Frederick Douglass, Richard Wright, um, Ralph Ellison, and others. In addition, we can focus on his production history and think about how so many producers such as Kanye West, Timberland, Pharrell, P. Diddy, and others have contributed also to his unique and distinct sound. So with that being said, you all, I guess what I want to leave with is Jay-Z is not the most current and contemporary rapper anymore. I don't think that even he wears the crown as saying he is the best rapper right now. However, oh, since 1996, at the age of 26, when he debuted, he has produced 13 solo albums. And I would argue he is still very much relevant as a rapper. When you look at Jay-Z, I want to encourage you not to just look at the exterior and think about, I want you to dig a little bit deeper. What is Jay-Z talking about? Why can his music exist? Where is his music coming from? And how is rap as a genre such an important American art form? I always think about how people say jazz is this great art form that was produced right here in America. I also think that rap music is also this same very inventive and unique art form that America can claim as one of its uh, very own homegrown inventions. 
So with that being said, you all, thank you so much for sitting, talking to me. I mean, sitting and listening to me right now with all of these information about Jay-Z. Thank you for listening to the songs. I hope that you actually did read them and look at the lyrics, because again, I'm a literature professor and I really believe in close reads. And last but not least, please, in your own time, check out my digital publication, the Jay-Z Mixtape at thejayzmixtape.com. Thank you so much. Thank you also so much, Dr. Coffey, for inviting me. Dr. Chris Coffey is a, um, a colleague of mine from graduate school. I say colleague, but I really mean family because we pushed and pulled each other across the finish line to our PhD. I'm forever indebted to you for your, um, for your encouragement as a graduate student. Evergreen, you have such a treasure, such a gem with Dr. Coffey. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Ken. That was great. Um, so the students, like, if you have questions, what we, we have two ways of asking them. If you want to ask in person, if you would raise your hand on, um, on the side, the, um, and we will call on you um, to ask the question directly. You can also, in the Q&A, write the question. So we, if we have enough people that want to raise their hands and actually ask the question, we'll alternate between the two. And usually it takes a few minutes for people to get started. Maybe while we wait for the students, um, I could ask a quick question. I'm really fascinated by what you're um, proposing, Dr. Ramsey. And I really thank you again for joining us yesterday and today and and really letting us travel beyond the confines of our spaces during this COVID era. So thank you again. Um, I think what is really, um, I mean, several things are super fascinating, but one of the things that I'm kind of now thinking again is um, you're beginning with Bakhtin's question of what is the novel. I think we could also through uh, Jay-Z sort of respond again to the question of what is an author? Because I think what you are proposing is this really brilliant way of rethinking literature and the literary effect, right? The role of the author as a public figure, as a public intellectual, as what I'd say Gramsci would say, um, and it's need to kind of um, not think even from ground up, but from the underground up, right? To think again about all these structures of power and the dynamisms that play the interaction between the text, the author, the reader, and so on in this radical new paradigm shift. And just wanted to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I guess one way I can even start by talking about that, I can remember when I took a history of hip hop my senior year in college, and I was so excited about it. And don't get me wrong, you all, I am a fan of rap music, but I remember for our final exam, we had to create a, uh, a rap verse. You all, I thought that was going to ruin my GPA because I started to really think about, oh my goodness, rapping really takes so much, it's so nuanced, particularly I think you have to think about the economy of space. It's similar to poetry, you have to use your words, your words are so much more important because the fewer words you use have a larger impact or they communicate a much more larger meaning. Um, particularly in thinking about this, I think about also rappers hold more credibility, sorry, than me as a professor in some types of ways. So I think it's one particular thing of how do we interpret what they're actually saying. I kind of want to advocate for, at least for my students, a more um, critical approach to all music in general, all written words in general. I don't want us to kind of do this high art, low art thing, you know, thinking like if it's not written, it isn't privileged. I love using this idea of uh, going back to thinking about how um, across the um, Middle Passage and even in uh, during the slavery era in America, how so much of the culture was retained through verbal art forms, through verbal jousting and these types of things. I really do think Signifying Monkey kind of shows us, is, as, as a theoretical approach, kind of helps us to really center this approach to think about what is this double voice language, what we're doing? How are we talking back and responding to past works? But how are we also articulating a more current new Black vision? And again, I'm only using uh, Henry Louis Gates signifying monkey as one thing. I think we can also look at Houston Baker's Turning South again to think about how does Jay-Z really um, 
how does Jay-Z really join this idea of thinking about past generations of life and history and how it affects or impedes upon our current selves? So with that being said, how is Jay-Z an author? I also, and I might get in trouble for this for the Die Hard lit folks, but I sometimes think rap is a little bit more than poetry. When you're rapping, you are, it's kind of a multi-dimensional type of mode. Number one, you have to keep your audience engaged. That's so important. You can tell right then if your audience is not being responsive sometimes. More than that, you have to think about the actual story you're telling and how does this actually uh, combine and go with the actual music. Again, I always think about my uh, senior year of college because I think that humbled me a lot to think about all the intellectual activities that were going on in terms of creating something. I will say this too, one last moment to this question. There's a YouTube video that's, going, uh, that's been published talking about Jay-Z and his uh, creating an uh, interlude called Public Service Announcement. It's one of my favorite, it's a two-minute song, but it's one of my favorite songs of Jay-Z in all times, it seems. And one of the things that I find so interesting is Jay-Z's album was completely done. He was doing press interviews. And in between the press interviews, he was inspired and he kept going back and forth and recording a song in various takes. Not only does that say something about his creativity as a rapper, but I think even the creative artist turned into this lets you know something about the discipline to being creative. We don't just wake up and have a poem or have a novel or have a short story that's produced in this pristine shape. We have to workshop it. We have to go back and forth saying, is this word right? We have to get people to review it. I really like that because for Jay-Z at least, he helps me think about the actual uh, creative abilities that go into producing rap music. So much harder than it looks. <laughs> I had a question. Hey, Eden, what's up? Oh, I'm hanging in there. Um, so. Why do you think rap has become so prevalent as like a social protest? And also, have you ever heard people compare rap to, I guess, I guess rap, I guess rap authors to people like Shakespeare and Plato? <laughs> Just, absolutely. I've heard that a couple of times. And I was kind of curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I can say this. I want to start with the second part of your question first. Do Have I heard people compare Jay-Z to, uh, or just rappers in general, to Shakespeare, Plato, even John Milton? Absolutely. One of the inspirations I have been, oh, wow, I've been teaching this Jay-Z course for four years now. One of my inspirations was, I was like, I don't think we have to go back that far to compare Jay-Z to literature. We can literally start by comparing him to Ta-Nehisi Coates. Again, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, all of these different types of people. I really think it's important for us to can put Jay-Z in this American type of uh, context to really think about how his work has developed in those types of ways. But no, absolutely, um, I have heard that. Could you re refresh me one more time on the first part of your question? So the first part was, why do you think rap has become like the forefront of social pro protests across the world. Like I've actually traveled to like, well, when I was in Korea in the military um, in Germany, you have all races, all types of nationalities. They are literally in the, their clubs. They're out there just rapping as best they can in their own language. They're trying to English. But it's become like this international, um, uh, what do you call it? Art form of social protest. Um, and I don't know what comes off of like the unusual institution of slavery in modern times in the United States, or whether it's like just, it feels good. I'm not sure what it's, but it's like, it's everywhere now. And I don't know why, why is it rap? Why is it not something else? Why is it not um, clogging or is it, um, I don't know, classical music, why do you think it's rap? Well, I think there's several reasons actually why I think rap is appealing, but I'm gonna speak from a more personal reason. It's the attitude about it. It's the confidence that it instills in you of just speaking directly. One of the things that I like to focus on in my class is the pronoun usage, this I, me, you. I feel like rappers are speaking directly to me. And I think this idea of an attitude, it really speaks to the aesthetics of rap music as well. For instance, I am very guilty of this, of using rap lyrics as a caption for my pictures on Instagram simply because it embodies so much of what I'm trying to capture. I think it's so interesting, too, because um, it, it really shows this international appeal. 
Uh, full disclosure, UTA is considered the fourth most diverse school in the nation in terms of student population. My Jay-Z class and History of Hip Hop is my most diverse class ever. All, I mean, everyone that you can think of is coming into this class. And more important, I find it so interesting when people from different walks of life can identify with stories from the childhood of a Brooklyn-born rapper. That is so important. So again, I think it's something about the attitude, the confidence, the culture that it instills in you. Something about the voice coming very proud and confident over a mic. For instance, 99 Problems, for instance, has been on repeat for me for so long because I really think that in 2003, that was a very cool way for Jay-Z to talk, articulate and use tools to think about uh, police brutality. One of the, of the reasons I think this is so important is because rappers do shape public discourse. Rappers do indeed influence the language. Um, a lot of times when I thought about, this is ironic to say this right now, but a lot of the, uh, the rapper who told me the most back then, coming of age and articulating certain challenges was Kanye West. Absolutely, his college dropout CD I think had enough theory, notice I'm saying theory, to really critique institutional racism. More power to Kanye now, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> I'm just trying to say, I think it is an attitude that it does help. So thanks for that question, that's really cool. Okay, I'm gonna read a question from, I have two questions, I'm gonna read it from Larry first. Larry says, firstly, thank you for your lecture, it's been excellent. I am interested in the transition of the perception of uh, rap into literary art. I'm curious of your perspective on Kendrick's recognition in the literary world. Do you think this opens this opportunity for recognition for artists like Jay-Z or Kanye West? Also, if possible, could you share your review of the book Signifying Rappers? Oh, okay, great, great, great. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for your comment. I really did enjoy this. Again, you all, uh, I did not realize how, you know, uh, isolated I was about these nerd topics, as I like to call. So I've definitely enjoyed this so much from the comfort of my living room. Um, do I think Kendrick, you know, I love Kendrick, actually. I actually like Kendrick a little bit more than Jay-Z. The only reason I don't teach a class on Kendrick is simply because Jay-Z has 13 solo albums and Kendrick does not have nearly as many. I hope moving forward that I can incorporate him into, um, into this idea of teaching somewhat on how he actually matures and evolves over time. I want to point out something about Jay-Z, too. His first album was released in 1996 at the age of 26. He was not a teenager when he released his first album. And I think that's so important because that says something about where he was mentally. I even think about when Kendrick Lamar came on the scene, he was a little bit more mature as well. And I think that definitely influences the type of stories he tells. Um, I do think this opens up a possibility for rappers like Jay-Z or Kanye. In particular, I think it really opens Jay-Z's book, Decoded, I think was so important simply because he really uh, describes the nuances of rap music and what's involved there. Um, another thing I'm not sure if you all know on the African American, uh, the Northern Anthology African American, the Northern Anthology of African American Literature, in the third edition, I think released in 2014, is so interesting as a nod because the editors included Jay-Z in terms of his music in actual text form within the book. So I do think there is a lot of um, opportunities for that. And I look forward to so many more publications to come out. The review of Signifying Rappers, I will be honest with you, I haven't finished reading it yet, but um, so far the introduction I have enjoyed. Um, Olivia McCormick, thanks so much. She says, I want to ask how you think Jay-Z as a rapper is so prolific versus other voices in the game. We hear about Tupac, Biggie, and Ice Cube's influences on modern hip-hop rap, but Jay-Z seems to really sit in the space in the public consciousness that is almost less uh, exclusive to rap. Thoughts? Ha-ha! Oh, oh, that was such a great question. And again, this is why I like talking about a rapper. I, my brother says, my brother's a professor too, and he has made this comment, and I found it to be true for me. I can walk into a class and say, Toni Morrison is the best novelist. Students write it down immediately. I can also say Langston Hughes is the best poet. Students write it down immediately. I say Jay-Z is the best rapper. Hands shoot up because everybody kind of wants to disagree. So I do like this creative conflict. Um, one of the reasons I think about Jay-Z, let's completely be honest about this. Beyonce, his wife, has done a lot to raise his visibility and make him still relevant even in 2020. I think that part, I also teach a Beyonce class. 
you can't have Jay-Z without Beyonce because they both have contributed so much to elevating each other's status. Um, when you talk about Tupac and Biggie, again, I do include lessons on them, but one of the biggest things is they don't have such a large, because their lives were cut short, they don't have this large and extensive catalog that I can pull from to show, hey, Jay-Z's first album, he was talking about this. But one of the things I noticed about Jay-Z comparisons I can make, profanity seems to decrease, especially after he has children. And I think that's something so interesting to talk about within the music because we see how life changes actually affect the the uh, actual art form. Um, but this idea of public consciousness, I, I, I don't know. I think Jay-Z, again, is a very significant rapper because he's still relevant as a rapper at 50. I think that's so important because we have not, hip hop is not old enough for us to see what other rappers might do moving forward. I think Jay-Z has been very visible in terms of supporting people and also offering types of, you know, different things. Now, it's debatable. I will say it's debatable about which songs by Jay-Z are the best and how he compares to other rappers. But I like that a little bit. I like to see the conflict. Jake, you asked the question, how does sampling support the university accessibility, a uh, university? You, uh, excuse me, how does sampling support the universality accessibility of Jay-Z's music? Reaching back into history and accessing a collective consciousness via signifiers. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for being here, number one. I, again, I cannot say this enough, you all. I have been, I have not had this much human interaction since the first week in March. Thank you. Um, how does this universality and accessibility of music? Now, that's something I think that is so interesting because... Uh, music costs, samples cost. And we can really see how this has affected certain types of rappers. If you're not a super producer or a rapper with heavy bucks, heavy money behind you, you probably won't be able to use as many samples as some other writers. I mean, some of the writers, excuse me, some other rappers, some other artists in general. So I really think particularly for us creatives, it really lets us see the importance of resources, the importance of capital in producing art. Now, I know this is something we don't usually like to talk about how art impedes upon, I mean, how money impedes upon our uh, creation of art, but this is a serious reality we have to consider, especially in a capitalist society. How can you have resources to actually incorporate these things? NPR did an amazing overview on sampling, and they incorporated several professors. I think Ninth Wonder is on there. I would encourage you to look at that. There are like five short videos, and I'll try to find that link and put that in the chat to look at it. Um, let me see, reaching back, the signifiers. One thing if you notice in that quote that I read from Ninth Wonder, he says you have to be a researcher, researcher, researcher. One of the things I typically hear is that, you know, new age music, you know, they don't really know how to play instruments. They don't know how to do this and do that. I tend to disagree strongly because I think producers are experts within music, not just in one genre either. They have to know about all of the particular art forms and how they might bring this all together to create something new. Uh, I will be for real. I don't think my music IQ is up enough to ever do something like that simply because you have to know songs that were the most popular and those little known songs as well. So... You know, I'm sorry, I didn't do you any justice with that question, but I do think samples at least are saying something about, as Amir Baraka would say, the changing saying. I'm paraphrasing. Nothing is ever new. We're just refashioning and remixing things to suit our current lives. Okay, Olivia, one more. Okay. Also, are you a Ka Kanye fan? Love his word. Pro are you saying Kanye or Kai? I'm not sure who Kai is, K-A. Also, are you a Kai fan? Love his wordplay, great work, but such a shame he's so underground. This is interesting because if it's Kai, I don't know who Kai is. Who might that be? I'm not necessarily sure, but I will say this about me as a rap fan. I am so into wordplay. Wordplay is one of the bigger things that I think I listen to music for because I always wonder why I can't be that clever. Lil Wayne is a New Orleans rapper, and I think one of the reasons he made an impression upon me is because he's so clever. He has this song called Eight, Six Foot, Eight Foot, or if I forget the name of it, but basically the line is, which has forever made an impression, real G's move in silence like lasagna. Take a little minute to get the, you know, the G in lasagna is silent. <laughs> with that being said, I thought that was so clever, and I always wonder, well, why can't I come up with that first? <laughs> 
Okay, Swan. Uh, but thanks for that question, Olivia. Swan, in what ways have you seen or not seen contemporary popular rap maintaining lyrics with a relatable social, historical, cultural message? Thank you for speaking to us today. Swan, thank you so much for even asking the question and participating. It's been a pleasure being here with you all, even virtually. Uh, now, this is a big thing, and this is where students love to get me because many of my students say, Dr. K, why do we listen to Jay-Z? We don't want to listen to him. Let's listen to someone new. His storytelling abilities is one of the things that I think always fascinates me and makes me put him up here with even some of the great literary artists. Now, I do want to make a very, very, very important intervention when we're talking about rap music. It did start off as a fun, play, have fun, feel good type of music, more so starting in parties. I think it's more important to uh, point out that the DJs were the most important parts because they were spinning and, you know, creating the vibe for the party. Then we had break dancers come in to kind of entertain during these parts. But rappers came in last into this, uh, into this equation because they had these breakdowns that they would let someone who had, you know, this gift of gab get on the mic and speak. Um, with that being said, we see that it tends to extend, 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 where now rappers are at the forefront. So I do think wordplay is very important in terms of offering lyricism and things like this, but I do also think the cleverness, the playfulness is also important. Think about Muhammad Ali's float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Now, I don't think we would call uh, Muhammad Ali a rapper, but this whole idea of talking, signifying, talking in time, even something that I can see that is very strong within the black church, you know, when preachers are using these rhyming words and using these cadences to keep the audience involved, I think all of that speaks, I guess, a little bit largely to the various techniques in rap music. If you, would be in my, if you were in my class and taking this course, this is something I ask students to debate about. What are first the techniques of rap music and what techniques do you think should be elevated more in conversations? So again, Swan, thank you so much for that question. We have a question from Luke also who want, who's gonna speak the question. So Luke, you need to unmute yourself for that. Hello? Hey. Um, you would remember me from yesterday. Uh, I asked the question with the Foucault. Uh, and it's great to see you again. I just want to also mention that you're an incredible speaker. It's really exciting to, to hear you talk. Um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, one of the things your talk today is, is making me think about is, is um, that though you don't like to talk about lower and higher forms of art, um, that it's possible that art, that rap might be the one of the highest um, because with things like sampling, it really brings the past back to the present and, and it continues to um, bring attention to like uh, very current crises. Um, uh, it's always in the news, it's always being talked about and it's always bringing up very serious concerns, um, very material concerns as well, talking about um, autobiographical information. Um, it makes people, uh, it, it raises that consciousness in a way. Um, and also it's, it sort of brings together, um, verbal versus more archival written forms of, uh, writing. So, uh, all those things that I'm bringing up, I really just want to ask a sort of bold question, which is, is it possible that rap is the most revolutionary form of art in history? And also... Um, how do, how do, uh, how should rappers maybe keep that momentum moving, not let it sort of, uh, die out as maybe a commodified, uh, part of society? Oh, wow. Luke, well, first off, that was a great question. I feel like that question, the response to that question could be an entire class, but I'm going to try to do it justice, just a tad bit. Um, as the most prolific art form right now, I think that's always debatable because I would say before rap, people would have said that about jazz. And I also think they have a very strong argument about jazz as well. But I guess I'm looking at this again. I, I keep mentioning this Amir Baraka essay, The Changing Same, because I think about how we're always inventing these new types of art forms. 
I have to use another Kanye West example. So on his album, College Dropout, he starts with this song, which is a spiritual talking about I'll fly away, like swing, you know, swing low, sweet chariot coming forth to carry me home. Then the next song right after that, he talks about a spaceship that he wants to come and liberate him and fly him to outer space. Stimly thinking about George Clinton and these types of things, spaceships, you know, liberating. Uh, so the idea from a chariot to a spaceship, I think the idea is still the same, but the message and delivery seems to change and always adapt to the times. I think that's why it's so important to put the back team discussion from yesterday. I, I wanted to lead with that to think about in the 40s. Bakhtin, or yeah, in the 40s, Bakhtin was kind of really advocating that, hey, this new form, the novel, is so important because, you know, we have this idea of cultural identity being formed within it. We can mix and match and incorporate so many different types of things, almost like, uh, um, uh, yeah, we can mix and match so many different types of things. Now, with that being said, I sometimes wonder, how does technology even influence hip hop in some types of ways? I think that's a big thing that we should probably think about in terms of the debate with this and what will technology look like in the future. I watch, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Patriot Act on Netflix, and I realize that technology is making songs shorter, much, much shorter, simply because streaming services are so important. So I think your average song now is two minutes and 30 seconds just so people can continuously loop the song. And for artists, that's very beneficial because that's more money. How do we think about moving forward and keeping the, you know, cultural potency of these uh, rap music? That is something that I am always constantly wondering because I don't know how you do that when money is such a great influence. In it. I, I really don't know how you do that when money is such a great influence. Keep in mind, you all, um, Jay-Z, when he started, when he started rapping, he had to be convinced to give up his life of crime in order to rap because rappers didn't make money. And he said, well, how can I provide for my family? I can't do this. He saw it as a hobby of some sorts at first. And I think a lot of the early rappers in the 80s and the 90s, again, we, even though we listen to their songs, even still as old school hits, we don't really uh, think about them the same way because they aren't as culturally relevant because, again, this idea of having access to public forums, having money, having capital. So... I think it's an amazing question, amazing question, but also you're kind of seeing how I start to talk about a few other characteristics, um, particularly related to how capital really shapes a lot of rap. And again, as I mentioned that Ralph Ellison essay earlier, you know, um, should rappers, should rappers, should hip hop fans be more conscious about how um, the big business side of rap it's kind of, you know, infringing upon the, again, the potency of the art form. Thanks so much for that question. A really cool question. Also, to let everyone know, I did put the link to the NPR uh, thing, the formula, a video series, series on the science of sampling. Um, I think it's really cool. I also want to say it's very fresh and very new. It came out March 27th. If you all are like me in the time of COVID, YouTube has become my best friend and I feel like I've learned so much information because I'm just going back and forth and looking at these small five minute videos. I think this is a very cool video that can probably do so much more justice on talking about sampling and how it has affected hip hop. One thing that I will say about this, Jay-Z pulls on the 70s for a lot of his samples, but you'll notice rap music that's come out in the past five years really draws on the 90s instead. Moving forward, we're going to have to think about when you're born in history, how does that affect the sound of your music, of your art? So um, I have a question for you. Um, can you tell us about your book that's coming out and, um, and will there be, what directions does that take and will there be more in that book? I'm particularly interested um, when you do the close reads and you're thinking about when you take down the fading to black, like that kind of thing, what is in this, your book? Okay, great. So I will be honest, my book is a tad bit different. It's more, a little bit more traditional. I focus on African-American and short fiction. And I was inspired to do work on short stories because of this. We're talking about, again, going back to Bakhtin, how, you know, the novel, he was advocating for this form. I would argue today that the novel is definitely privileged. It is definitely privileged so much. So much, in fact, that I think the short story has been kind of overlooked in scholarship while we've had so much exciting work being done, particularly in African-American literature. 
uh, one of the reasons I decided to focus on the short story form is because I am a professor, right? And during the semester, or as are you all doing quarters, we tend to read less novels, even though novels are privileged with the awards, and tend to focus on short stories. You know, to say like, hey, we're not going to read Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God, but we are going to read Sweat and Spunk and see how these stories might have served as a sketch pad you know, moving forward. One of the reasons why I really like focusing on this is because similar to rap music, similar to the short fiction, these composite narratives I like to think about, how are characters so important to, you know, really shaping this idea of what's going on? How do they drive a narrative? How do different type of characters drive narratives? Particularly, I always talk about Jay-Z starting in 1996, and then I talk about him, you know, retiring in 2003. When we see him as a character evolving, I always compare him to characters within Edward P. Jones's short fiction. If you all do not know about Edward P. Jones, get into him. I love Edward P. Jones. He has two collections of short stories, Lost and the City, and All on Haggard's Children. And one of the things in Edward P. Jones' story that I like, he always kind of recycles characters, almost like Shakespeare, you know, the doubling going on. So it's the idea of once the, chap the character that you see in chapter one, you might see them reappear again in a larger or smaller role in chapter one of his next book. Uh, with that being said, I really want to focus on how characters are such an important fig a point in, um, in literature in general in terms of driving the 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 narrative. I make three distinctions between characters. A homegrown character, which is someone born and raised in a particular environment. An outsider character, obviously it's kind of clear, someone who's born outside of somewhere and comes into a new community and is a, a big, you know, really different. And then I have this unique thing that I call a homegrown outsider. A homegrown outsider is someone who was born and raised within there, but because they're exposed to different knowledge or return or travel somewhere, return home, they really don't fit in into their home environment. Aha, this man, you know, the invisible man, homegrown, outsider. So again, this is what I'm working on, and I'm particularly interested in geographic representations. For instance, if Jay-Z was born in Louisiana, would his narratives be different? If Jay-Z had been born in California, would his narratives be different? How does the actual structure of the geography inform how someone produces a story? Even though in African American literature, we talk a lot about migration histories, I am more so interested in thinking about what opportunities exist for creative writers, for creative artists using a particular setting. I think about James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. New York, just the setting of New York, offers so many possibilities for him to talk about Harlem, for him to think about a club in the village, for him to think about subways. You can't do that everywhere. So I really advocate that characters and geography are two important artistic features that we should really pay more attention to. And I will be honest with you, that has kind of been informed by my engagements with rap music. I'm always interested in how when a rapper is born somewhere else, their sound sounds so different, yet it's still under this large umbrella of rap. I had a quick question. Okay. What, what you just remind me of, so I was kind of curious, do you think that an African-American writing from Washington State, which would be me, would write from a different perspective than an African-American writing from New York uh, City or from Alabama? Do you think that comes out, from all the reading you've read, do, do you see like these um, uh, continuality of just themes with writers that write from different places, different geographical places, not positions in life, um, how they kind of, they're kind of different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first let me start this by saying this. I hope that you are from Washington State, that your stories would be different because number one, you're going to look at New York differently. I'm from Jackson, Tennessee. You're gonna look at that place so much differently and you're gonna probably look at things that I took for granted every day and just a normal walk. So absolutely, I do think where you are from literally changes the composition and the makeup of your work. I think Zora Neale Hurston, going back to her, she was from Edenville, Florida. I think that's so important to consider in her representations of the South because, you know, she grew up in one of the first black, the first black incorporated town in the United States. And in some types of ways, it was a predominantly black town. It was a predominantly black town where business was thriving. So in some instances we see in her short story, she does not really talk about a lot of interracial conflict. She talks about intraracial conflict. 
Now, flip that with someone like Wright, for instance. You know, his short stories are always filled with interracial drama, but I could kind of see that growing up in rural Mississippi and Arkansas. And I always think about their big fight, you know, I mean, Wright and Hurston, you know, Wright, uh, Hurston, his stuff is too violent. Uh, Wright, her stuff is like a minstrel show. And I think they're from this broad territory, which is the South, but their experiences have diff have profound effects on how they shaped it. I mean, on how they represent it. I think Zora Neale is very fond of the character speaking on the front porch. She's very fond of certain types of things passing through the town, having community gossip. Right? We don't see that necessarily, but I also think that's definitely because of perspective. Um, perspective actually is one of the things I love about a book because it enriches it so much. Um, I read, again, James Baldwin, born in Harlem, New York, but he has a short story about a lynching that takes place in an unknown southern town and going to meet the man, Ralph Ellison from Oklahoma. But again, he has a song, a, a story party down at the square about a lynching as well. They're not southern writers in that particular regard. So I think it's very important to see their representations of the South. Trudy or Harris, a literary critic, has this book called The Scary Mason Dixon Line that says, for Black writers, Black American writers, no matter where you were born, you align a crucial part of your identity with the South because of just really the tragic history of slavery and Jim Crow. So I do like to see how writers kind of step outside of their comfort zones and kind of write about something where they're, you know, where they're not from because it pushes you. You have to really think about the details and where the history meets, you know, life, current life. Good question. Good question, Eden. Thanks. So I know we're coming closer to the uh, end of our time, and I just want to thank you, Dr. Ramsey, for joining us, that we could still um, have an opportunity to host you and to have you speak with our students. I just wanted to ask one question um, as we kind of wind down to the end, which is I'm interested in hearing about the uh, reception of your work because well, I uh, appreciate and um, uh, love the fact that you are bringing these critical questions about rap music and other um, art forms into the academy. I'm wondering what has been the um, uh, reception of the work that you're doing outside of the academy where there might be um, people who are not able to see and understand um, how much this uh, as an art form is giving and uh, giving to kind of the critical questions that we continue to go over in, in colleges and universities? Oh, Dr. Coffey, thank you so much for that question. I spoke about this a tad bit, or I alluded to it in your class the other day, but I would say when I started doing this work as a graduate student, I'm not going to say I was definitely not the first by any means, but I do think it was seen as an idea like, okay, you have to do something else in addition to this, you know, to be seen as credible so to speak. Um, but you know, the reason why I'm not too worried or pushed by that is because again, you are, I did a PhD in African American literature. And I think that my advisors, my dissertation uh, chair and committee members, they did not have the opportunity to do, um, to finish do actual degrees in African American literature. They had to do British literature, Victorian literature, American literature broadly, and then kind of do independent studies in African American literature. I would definitely say, oh, since as a graduate student, I felt like I was doing an independent study alongside my, you know, a major, more traditional project. I can definitely say in 2020, I've been a professor for five years now, in 2020, I can definitely say there is a big, huge excitement about hip hop, particularly hip hop history. And I think that gets so important because when you think about students and where they are thinking about with hip hop, and not just students, but even think about the larger popular culture, people sometimes are more into the current history. But I have seen and I've been so inspired by so many people are uh, wanting to look back and learn about history. Oftentimes, many of my students, particularly my women students, which I really love, they are always saying, hey, 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 Dr. K, where are the women? in this history of hip hop, because I know women didn't just start rapping at one day and just kind of came out of the blue. So these types of questions I think are so cool and it fits within this larger paradigm of black studies, African-American studies of doing recovery work. We don't think about doing recovery work of the 1980s and the 1990s, but I'm so excited, always uh, so impressed about this idea of 
how rap music is really penetrating and people are seeing this not only as an art form. I, I usually, in short, I don't have to make the case anymore. And I, I can remember a time for me, at least, when I used to come in saying, okay, well, okay, I do think rap is literature. Many people kind of look at me now like, okay, we know that. Can you tell us something interesting about it? And I really like that, you all. It seems like I come across defensive sometimes. I say, hey, 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 rap is literature. But I'm so happy about that because I get to think about so many other topics about how like, how does sampling kind of uh, reconfigure what we think about? How does capital influence the type of art you can make? Oh my God, light years ahead of where I was when I started this in 2000 between 2018, whatever, which you were there for, Dr. Coffee. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Kenton. Kenton, hey, I, you know, I remember you, Kenton. You have a question. You mentioned that drawing on different locations is easier for people with more resources. Some small dramas and movements have already formed entirely online as opposed to in a specific locale. How do you think the rise of internet communities are going to affect the geography of music? What will it mean for the music? Oh, Kenton, this is an amazing question. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Vox. Vox actually has already done this and explained it far better than I can. And I think it's like a nine minute video about how the rise of the super producers are canceling sounds and can't, I mean, not canceling, excuse me, flattening sounds and normalizing sounds. One of the things I think about Jay-Z is when he first started working on his first album, his debut album, and really his first three albums, he was working primarily with people in New York. The more money he got, he was able to kind of expand his reach and kind of work with so many various people. Um, I think that's a cool thing. Someone also mentioned me about Kendrick. I think it's so funny because, you know, Kendrick is like me. We're 80s babies. And Kendrick always is a Compton, born in California, but always talked about how he was so influenced by Southern rappers. That came about totally because of Napster. I do think in the age of COVID, we are going to probably surprise ourselves and get so much more creative about how we use these online communities. Um, even though it's very unfortunate about COVID, I am so happy that Zoom exists that I was still able to meet with you all, actually talk about these various things. So I really don't, I try never to even predict what creative communities are going to do with technology because think about it just like jazz. Those instruments weren't supposed to be played like that, but people shaped and repurposed uh, the instrumentations for their actual use, on uses. I see the same thing happening with, I mean, uh, the geography of music. When I was in graduate school, I used to just play around on Twitter, play around online, and Rap Genius, the thing that I was pulling up from you all when we were going through the lyrics, someone reached out and said, hey, would you like to be an editor? I was literally doing it as a hobby, but it really opened me up to this, on this community of online people working within music. So I really do think, uh, particularly even for me as an African-American literary scholar who's interested in hip hop, while at my university, I might be unique, Online, I have such a wide community of people that I can pull on, and I really do like that. Um, but the rise of internet communities are going to affect the geography of music. I don't know. I really don't know how that's going to be. You know, what does it mean about me, a Southerner, being influenced so much by a Brooklyn-born rapper? What does that do for my lexicon even? Also, Kendrick Lamar, someone who's on the West Coast, I find myself incorporating a lot of the popular term and I mean, popular culture phrases and slang that they use in their music as well. I use that in my everyday music. I mean, everyday speech with friends, even though I live in Dallas, Texas. So even still, just not necessarily with music, but I have seen um, the variations of I've seen just having access to different styles of music as being something so influential. I remember Jay-Z once talking about how prolific and how important he is. He said he didn't really become popular into the South, in the South until he did a song with UGK out of Houston, Texas. I think that's so important because we tend to think about Jay-Z as this huge phenom, but we didn't think that rap, at least starting in the 90s, was so reason regional. Again, West Coast War, West Coast versus East Coast War. I think that says something about regionality. But moving forward, oh, this is going to be so cool to think about how many people are even able to collaborate even online. Think about this in COVID. I'm sure music is still being made and we have so much technology that really facilitates our ability to collaborate with people who are not even, you know, literally in the room with us. Similar to this. Kenton, of course, you know, I appreciate that question and I love your name. <laughs>
All right. Well, let's, um, you, you can't hear us all applaud, but thank you, Dr. Kenton Ramsey, for coming to us. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. Oh, I cannot say thank you enough, you all. Again, if this was the virtual hospitality, I can only imagine what right. I would have had in person. All right. And literally, Dr. Coffee, Dr. Um, Dr. Kastanis, Kastanis, I am so fortunate that you all invited me and let me really vibe and nerd out with your class. That's something I really appreciate. So you'll come back. Oh, I hope so. I hope I can visit in person. I really. All right. right. We got to do it. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you all again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also, Shaw Osho, for putting together this amazing art lecture series for our college, giving us this opportunity to have people like Dr. Kenton Ramsey. It's we really was, appreciate your work. Great. We'll see you in the fall. Keep people coming. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>